first isolated myself. Okay, couldn't sleep. It was difficult to accept. I started crying. It was bitterness. I hate it now. Nobody can, nobody can ever want to stay around an HIV camp. As of 2016, it was found that Kenya is the fourth largest HIV epidemic in the world alongside Mozambique and Uganda. About 5.4% of the Kenyan population are living with HIV, with about 64,000 new infections in every year. Over the time, we have, turned, we have come to over-sexualize the idea of HIV, and as a result, we discriminated people by labeling them as immoral. However, as you will see, this is not the case. The purpose of this documentary is to change the status quo in regard to the common perception and discrimination against people living with HIV and AIDS. So in our setting, we decided to choose the Rafiki Adolescent Centre located in Indoret. It's a one-of-a-kind centre whereby it incorporates both the HIV positive adolescents and the HIV negative adolescents. Therefore, it reduces the stigma and uh, at the same time, it also um, assists the HIV positive adolescents to be more accepted in the system. What was your first response when you found out your status? I wasn't that reactive, but it haunted me a lot. Uh, I had a lot of questions to ask. I like, okay, father, uh, it happened that uh, it was an accidental disclosure that um, I didn't get it from my guardian, I didn't get it from the doctor, I got it from the school, like, but it really disturbed me a lot, like I couldn't sleep until I went, I remember it was 11 at night, I went to my mom, my, my guardian's room, asked her. Uh, I heard my cousin telling you that uh, I, was go I was going for the funding for the people who live with that, I will take care of this. Does that mean I have HIV? Because this, uh, as from what the teacher said, uh, it's taken by people who are HIV positive. She ran out of words. And uh, that's when now the discussion started. What challenges have you been facing with time? Okay. Challenges have been so many. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I like something you can remember. I can remember back in high school. I had an instance where my home. Reaching for my drugs became a challenge. I remember the, you know these boarding schools where by you have to and by that time I used to take it twice in a day over there and like now I'm taking it twice so I had to take it in the morning and then they would so there's this one room you would come out of the pitch by going back to the hostess to rest that evening when getting the room I found my box open you know this one show about stealing your eyes of the school yeah Somebody had knocked off my padlock, so the band and the, the, the keys were open. So back in my mind, I just rushed to see. And my drugs are, have my drugs been, been, been touched. So when looking at them, I felt like somebody had, had tampered with my property. So, so I kept I kept quite as if something, nothing has happened. But in the evening, my friend came and my friend came and asked me. I used to sleep on the lower part and I sleep on the top. Come and ask me, I saw some guys looking inside the box. What are they looking for? Then I told them, who are they? Because I was anxious to know who are they first, in the first instance. So in the, in the instance of asking who are they, they didn't know what they were looking for. So he came and just told me, ah, yeah, so and so. So I had to approach them. But I was, I had that fear in me. That they know. The good thing or the bad thing is one of them knew, but he, was, he wasn't sure it was the same drugs. So as time went by, the way they used to talk about it is what made me realize they knew it. And I started feeling like I'm like, being mm -hmm. discriminated. Because they started moving, each one of them started distancing themselves from me. Mm -hmm. It affected me that time, the following time I had to shift from the school. And I felt like I was in that place.
there was a moment I used to bump into the one, one, of, one of the guys in the church. It really, it really affected me. I couldn't, I couldn't go psychologically. And they told others? Huh? They told others? Yeah, they used to talk about it, but they were, they were like, they were not sure about it. They used to say they have seen some big pins in my, in my pockets, in my box. That's what they used to say. Ikapata a different reaction. If you end up in some, like, let's say, chapel or lunch or breakfast, when I'm going to sit with them to the table, the usual people that are in Mizraku now, they will stand now and talk here to you who are in there. When you ask them, I'm in Yaku. So, I love to tell you when Mwadimu Akiwa and Afundisha Kuivu Mbele about, let's say, biology, I love to maybe to abuse anything about HIV. People will start murmuring at you, 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 Made you want to take your life? Well, it was a really At first, I went it with my mom. Because I, I used to say that she's the main reason why I'm, I have this. And she's the main reason why I can't live like any other girl outside. Yeah. So I said that's the end of me. Still living my life and taking drugs. Like that, so the need the most to invest to get off my life and I move just like that. But come to realize I knew that, and somebody was telling me that no one can, no one could ever want to stay around and treat a victim, no one could ever want to marry a person who is positive. So I came. Then I, when I opened up my body, went to my doctor, and my doctor told me that there are people in Madrid who believe happy, mm -hmm. just like that. In Fanyani, I dropped my studies. I wasn't that comfortable to be sad. At what point did you drop out? No, I did not drop out completely. I dropped my academics. Like I was a B student. But I was in a situation where I was up on the lower level. I didn't remember my hobby. People would stand, people would go. It comes up so much like I'm losing concentration. I would really, really go to tenure press. But in my Kusoma, I'm there writing about what has happened during the day. I think I dropped a design in my studies dramatically, but it won't go to the university for me. So, I'm starting to improve. And I finished my high school with a good grade. What do you want people to do differently? What do you want the government to do differently? What do you want school institutions to do differently? What do you want the society to do differently? About the government, I would like them like to change the syllabus to even my little class textbook like eight skills, such as this skills. It doesn't skill I'm twenty nine years old and I haven't died. Yeah. My mom is fifty five years old. My dad is is sixty years old. Now they kufa. So the like like what seems that the syllabus part. Yeah. Yes, the network is involved in some training which I go out there and get people who are more serious than me. Like, what more serious? They are in that state. Like, we know them, we are amateurs and them, but okay. when you just look at them, you can do a to like, this person is basically positive, and as they, as they accept Baru, I hope Baru is stigmatized.
what uh, prompted you to start up the Rafiki Center in the first place? Okay, Rafiki Center was opened in the year 2017, actually 2016 in December. And it was opened after we realized that uh, we, have, we were having a lot of difficulties with uh, handling of adolescents who are HIV infected, who currently are being seen in the form of empathy. So, uh, we had challenges transitioning them to the adult care programs and uh, the adults were not quite confident about handling them. So, we opened this centre basically for the HIV infected, but we realised it was going to be difficult to open it as an HIV centre because of the stigmatisation around HIV. So, because of that, we had to open it as an open centre for every adolescent irrespective of their HIV status. So, so that there's no stigma, there's no adolescent who fears to walk in here. Do you feel that as of now you have uh, achieved your goals that you had for Rafiki? Yes, we have achieved our goals because Rafiki Centre currently handles over 900 adolescents living with HIV. And we also handle a number of HIV negative adolescents who walk in from various um, programs. Uh, at Rafiki Centre, we have the uh, reproductive health services being provided. We offer family planning and counseling, as well as the service provision, long term methods, short term methods. So, we have a lot of services working here for this family planning. We also have social activities such as uh, salsa dancing, which happens every day from 3 pm up to 6 pm. So, we have a lot of programs from um, the nearby universities as, as well as the colleges. So when they walk in here, we take the opportunity to talk to them about many things. STI screening we do here and treatment for free basically. Mm -hmm. We have uh, testing for pregnancy here for free. Uh, we have uh, testing for VDRL for free. So basically those activities are attracting adolescents here. And we think that we have reached somewhere. We have uh, adolescents who, have, uh, um, who are gay. Mm -hmm. Who also see services here, including provisional uh, prep, provisional prep. But where do you see Rafiki in 10 years' time? In 10 years' time, I would like to see one of the best adolescent care centers in Africa, <laughs> right here at Rafiki. I want to know that uh, because of the misery discrimination and this youth face discrimination every day in different aspects of their lives. So what has Rafiki done to eradicate that? One of the things we've done to eradicate stigmatization basically is to have this center as a holistic care center, not just HIV. So we have our HIV infected adolescents mixing with the HIV negative adolescents throughout the day. And uh, we have sessions with them where we talk about HIV and make sure that the ones who are not living with HIV are aware that we have those ones living with the HIV here. and to us there is no difference between the two of them. To us these are just young people trying to struggle through their life. And then we have our adolescents going out to schools and to universities and speaking out um, about their HIV status. Most of them were born with the HIV. So it is really not something we got into some risk taking behavior. So we, they are able to talk about it in school and help people understand that not everybody living with HIV got it out of some risky behavior. Mm -hmm. You can just find you, it just happens. So we send them to schools. We, like currently, we are meeting heads of schools in almost all the counties that come back for us. And we talk to them about the challenges that children going to schools face because of their HIV status. And we try to help them understand how to support these people and how to be less stigmatized. We have also met pastors, we have met community health volunteers, we have met chiefs and assistant chiefs and other administrative officers and talked to them about why they need to support children who are living with children. So we feel like it's a war we are fighting one step at a time.